So our speaker today is Professor Karen Daniels. Um, she's a professor at uh, North Carolina State University. Um, she did her PhD um, in uh, at the University of Cornell and she got her PhD in 2002 and then moved to Duke University to, uh, for a postdoc before going to North Carolina. Um, she's been also a visiting uh, scholar uh, in Germany at the uh, Max Planck Institute. And uh, in recognition of her, of her work, she's been elected a fellow of the American Physical Society. Uh, her work uh, focus, uh, focuses on non-equilibrium dynamics um, and uh, nonlinear dynamics of granular flows, gels, and fluids. But today, I think she's going to work. Uh, she's going to um, uh, talk about her recent work on uh, fingers and fractals. Uh, at the surface of liquid metals. So please make a warm welcome uh, for Karen Daniels. All right, thank you so much for this very kind invitation. Um, this was, uh, it's always lovely right now to see all the names popping up in Zoom that are clearly from all over the world. Um, and you know, some of you are probably in strange time zones right now. Um, so it's 11 a.m. for me here. Um, and you know, some of you are probably uh, late at night. Um, so thank you for staying up. Uh, to listen. Um, and this is, I think, one of the, the benefits of us being able to meet online right now is this, you know, unique time when we can sort of meet, uh, meet from afar, um, where we might not even be able to if we were um, travel, if, you know, travel was so expensive. All right, so the picture on the right, um, we'll get to sort of explain as we go on, um, but those are liquid metals that are making some pretty cool patterns. Um, and I will explain what they are um, and what's actually going on there. Okay, so, but I'm gonna start actually with a little bit of surface tension discussion um, because not everybody who works in fluid dynamics you know, thinks about it or facial flows. Um, and you know, the simplest question is why are droplets so spherical? Um, and so this is actually an alum from my own university up on the space station, uh, Christina Cook, um, showing a very nicely circular droplet acting as a lens. Um, and if you've ever played with mercury um, here on earth, you'll see they're actually quite remarkably spherical. Um, because of their very high surface tension. And the thing that everyone always says is, ah, you know, they're circular to um, you know, minimize uh, the, the surface area. Okay, so we're gonna need to know a little bit more than that um, later in the talk. Um, and so I wanna get us thinking um, about what the molecular origins of surface tension are. Um, so speaking very much as a physicist who thinks about discrete objects, not just about continua. Um, if you compare the molecules um, that are in the bulk of a liquid uh, to the ones that are uh, at the surface. Um, the, the ones in the bulk have more neighbors than the ones at the surface, okay? More neighbors who, who match, you know, match themselves. Let's pretend that this is a vacuum up there, you know, just for the moment. Um, and because there are more neighbors and the distance between the molecules is set by being in the lowest potential energy state, you know, they're adding up more negative numbers um, gives you a lower number than adding up fewer like negative numbers. And so um, the surface molecules are in a higher potential energy state than um, the bulk molecules and therefore that's less preferred, okay? And so the way I wanna think about surface tension is not as a force, um, but I wanna think about it as an energy per unit area that's required to increase the surface area. So anytime you create surface, you have to pay this energetic cost per unit area, okay? Um, and of course, that has the same units um, as attention, you know, force uh, per unit length. Okay, but I think that this definition is going to be more um, suitable for us understanding what's going on uh, coming down the road. Okay. Um, so the second piece is how I got involved in this project. And so, um, so I'd never worked on liquid metals um, and or really metals of any sort. But Michael Dickey, my colleague in chemical engineering, showed me um, this figure at left and you know this video. Um, and said, hey, I've been working with liquid metals. Um, here's something cool I think you'd like. He knows my taste uh, in pretty pictures. Um, and what you're seeing um, is a droplet um, of a liquid metal. Um, it's called E-gain, and I'll talk a little more about what that is down the road, um, being um, squeezed out of a needle, okay, into, in this case, it's a sodium hydroxide bath, okay. Um, and there's a small voltage being applied, 
Okay, and so a side view of the movie um, you can see is that as the voltage is increased, the droplet spreads out laterally. Okay, um, so this is like it's having lower surface tension. Okay, but if you look at it from the top, you can see that it does not at all spread out uniformly. It spreads out very irregularly. And um, these weren't particularly well controlled experiments um, in the, the plane because they weren't expecting this phenomenon. Okay, but it was extremely striking. And I said, you know, how are we getting these moose antlers, you know, um, this, you know, it's not quite fractal like here, right, but it's definitely in, um, along those lines. And how is that actually happening? What's the mechanism by which this happens? Okay, and they had already identified uh, a bit of it. And this is why we're going to talk about surface tensions and surfactants, okay? And so this is surprising, right? So this, the fact that a metal droplet is spreading out so, right, so this is, you know, less than a millimeter thickness here, okay, is surprising, right? Because, you know, if we think, we think of water as having a high surface tension, say, you know, these are approximate numbers, 70 millinitons per meter. Um, if you add a surfactant, you can basically drop that in, in half. Okay, that's the best you can do for the most part. Okay, and that still doesn't get you down to some of where the, the low surface tensions of organics and alcohols are, which are sort of down around 20 millinitons per meter. Okay, so to see very, very flat um, droplets for a metal that you think of as having you know, a very high surface tension, you know, metals commonly are several hundred millinewtons per meter surface tension, so, you know, 10 times that of water. Um, what's the surfactant that's letting that happen? Okay, what is the surfactant that's letting that happen, and why is it coming from applying a voltage in an electrolyte? Okay, so that's, that's the, the question that we are actually still working on, and um, what that surfactant actually is, but we have some pretty good sense of it at this point. And if you haven't heard of a surfactant before, or you've heard the word and doesn't, don't know exactly what it is, um, it just stands for surface active agent. Um, and if we go back to the picture I showed in the beginning, I've now added an example surfactant um, to the surface here. This might be, say, a two-tailed lipid, like you learned about in your uh, biology classes, right? And lipids and you know, other surface active agents, surfactants, um, have a hydrophilic head and a hydrophobic tail, right? And so they will dance along the surface so that their head is in the water and their tails are not. That's their lowest energy state, okay? And what that means is that this surface molecule has now gained some neighbors that it didn't have before. And they're not perfect neighbors, but they're reasonably good neighbors, right? Um, and as a result, okay, it is now less energy required to increase the surface area than there would have been for a clean system, okay? And so this means that the surface tension is reduced. There's less cost per unit area to create new surface, okay? So contaminants at the surface in general have this property. And in fact, this is something that we are all paying very close attention to these days, right? So if you take a look at the um, zoom in on a coronavirus, it is of a type of virus that has a lipid bilayer um, as this orange membrane around it, okay? Um, and the great thing is because it has that lipid layer, right, that means that surfactants can interact um, with that lipid layer, okay? Um, and so if you have a droplet of water that's full of soap, right, and here again, there's hydrophilic and hydrophobic ends, right, the hydrophobic um, ends of the soap molecules in water would prefer to be hanging out um, inside the lipid layer um, rather than in the water, um, and so they insert their tails uh, into there, this breaks open the virus, the DNA spills everywhere, and you no longer have an active virus, right, so the ability of surfactant molecules um, to disrupt uh, surfaces um, is at the heart of why we can do even a, a small amount of uh, interaction these days. Okay, so what is EGAN? Um, so this is a movie from uh, Michael Dickey's lab, and this is all done in air. Okay, so unlike the other movies I'm gonna show you later on, these are all experiments that he was doing in air so that you can see all the cool things that can go on. And so what you'll see is he can place droplets, okay? Um, he's using a syringe to squeeze them out. Um, and they're not merging with each other, right? This is not uh, behavior you're, you're used to seeing with droplets. And that's because there is an oxide skin that forms, okay, um, very rapidly in air, okay? And so this material, um, why are we using this material? Well, one, it forms this skin, so it's convenient. Two, um, very conveniently, EGAN is a nice mixture of gallium and indium that melts um, at 15 degrees C, right? So gallium itself um, is solid, just solid at room temperature. And by adding in one part um, out of three of indium, it actually, eutectic means lowest melting point. Um, it raises, sorry, lowers the melting point to where it's liquid at room temperature, okay? 
And so it has these great promise for doing things like you're seeing now, like squeezing out um, droplets, squeezing out wires, very manipulable um, because it's a got the viscosity only about twice that of water. It's non-toxic, right? And so from an engineering standpoint, it's a fascinating material to be playing with. It retains its conductivity. You're about to see something cool here. You string a wire across and the two LEDs light up, okay? Um, Michael has more, um, if you just Google Michael Dickey on your YouTube, you'll find it. Um, has more images of the kinds of things he's trying to do with this from an engineering perspective, okay? Um, but because of these really wonderful properties, okay, being non-toxic, easy to flow, making this oxide, um, there's a lot we can imagine with reconfigure reconfigurable electronics if we can learn to control um, the fluid dynamics of this, okay? And the convenient thing is the oxide right here looks, you know, super robust, right? You can build little, um, objects out of it, okay? But I'm gonna show you now how easy it is to get rid of it, okay? So if you've spread out a lumpy object in air, um, you can take either an acid or a base, this is hydrochloric acid. And if you put an acid or base on it, it will dissolve that oxide, okay? And it rolls right back up into being a nice uh, sphere again, okay? So this is a very reversible process and that's quite different than surfactants that we think of um, like soap and water. So if you disperse soap and water, good luck getting the soap back out, right? In this case, um, we are able to just wash, you know, in some sense, the oxide right off the surface into um, being dissolved back into the acid or base very, very simply. Okay, so I'm going to show that original, I'm going to show the movie version of that initial image I showed you again. If here's the droplet of egain. It's now in sodium hydroxide. You apply a voltage, and the surface tension decreases and the droplet becomes pancake shaped. This is what many of you uh, would anticipate if you've seen um, interfacial uh, flows like this before, okay? But then what's remarkable is what the top view of that is. But I'm gonna focus on that surface tension uh, for just a second here before we go back to the top view, okay? Um, so what's going on here is that when we make an oxide, and this is one of our guesses as to what the oxide actually is, is Ga2O3. Um, with an OH group attached to it, okay? And what that means is that the um, gallium side of the molecule is metalphilic, right? And the OH side of the molecule is hydrophilic, okay? And so if you have e gain sitting in, in all the experiments I'm gonna show you going forward are sodium hydroxide, you have, um, so, or some electrolytes, it's, um, you know, of that ilk, um, some salt dissolved in water. Um, you're gonna have one end that likes the metal and one end likes the water, okay? So the oxides themselves are gonna act much like lipids do, okay? And so if you do a surface tension measurement, um, and what they did here was measure, um, measure angles, so goniometry basically, okay? Um, and so they measured the surface tension of the droplet as you applied the voltage. Actually, at first it went um, up and then it dropped precipitously. And around here, they stopped being able to make good measurements, right? And the question was, was this dropping all the way to zero? Um, at the time, they did not know. They hypothesized that it was. Okay, and what's really cool here is that I told you some of the numbers for water, that if you take water, 70 millinewtons per meter, you add surfactant, you drop it down by about half. Okay, here, we're taking a material that has at its largest 500 millinewtons per meter and dropping it down. You know, even on this graph, we can see it to 10% of its value. And now we know we can go basically all the way to zero. Okay, so this is a much more dramatic effect than any surfactant is um, in a water-based system. All right, so the first problem that uh, I engaged with on this was to take those things that looked like they were going to form fractals and actually get them to make a nice symmetric uh, experiment, you know, where we could have a well-controlled um, setup to see what sort of patterns we might get. Um, and so coming from a pattern formation background, you know, you want things to be uh, as homogenous as possible, as large aspect ratio as possible, okay? And so we were, um, we built, this is about a 30 centimeter across um, stadium, okay? Um, that was on, a le on leveling plates. Um, we used as the working electrode, went right up in the center, okay? And the droplet would be placed on top of that, okay? And then a counter electrode was a large, um, copper ring around the outside so we would get a radially symmetric, um, sorry, um, uh, electric field that we'd be applying. Now, because this is an electrochemical reaction, right? We're applying a voltage. 
to an electrolyte, right? You're gonna remember from your chemistry classes that this produces bubbles. Happily, those are at the counter electrode where we're not gonna see them. Um, and that if you want to maintain a constant voltage or a constant current, you're gonna need a reference electrode um, that's placed inside the electrolyte um, so that your potentiostat can maintain either a constant voltage or constant current. Okay, so this is actually a three electrode system, um, which is standard for electrochemists, um, but was a new gig uh, for me to work with. Okay, so this is what the setup looks like, and we're applying tiny voltages. You know, these are a few volts. This is not, not much of anything here. Okay. Um, and this is what you get when um, you get tuned to a nice voltage, um, where you sort of get the best patterns. Okay, is that a droplet now, and remember this is a top view, we're not injecting fluid, it's just the dropper becoming, droplet becoming flatter and flatter and flatter. Okay, so over time, um, more oxide is building up on the surface. There's also more surface growing, which means to get covered in oxide. Um, some of that oxide is also simultaneously dissolving off into the sodium hydroxide. Okay, and at some point the necks become so thin um, that droplets snap off, okay? But if you look at the outer edge, what you're seeing is that there are um, ripples that grow on top of ripples that grow on top of ripples and so forth. So classic fractal-like behavior. And what we also learned, and I stopped the movie before these went off screen, is there's always a downhill. We have never gotten something perfectly level. There's always a, a downhill where a small droplet of mercury can just roll off screen. Um, I want to pause here at this, at the sort of end of this picture for one other reason, which is that, you know, we're trying to understand what the surface tension, you know, of these um, materials are. And so one is that this picture shows that there's areas of both positive and negative curvature within here. Um, and this suggests that these are some very low surface tensions, um, if we can get both directions of curvature going on uh, in the same system, okay. There are almost also certainly gradients um, in, in oxide um, concentration. We'll get to that uh, in a minute as well. Um, the last thing is how thin are these little wires here? And that will be the second half of the talk. I'll talk more about isolating just that wire-like phenomena. But we're going to look at the fractals first and see if we can understand what's going on here. So that was just one example. Um, so that was, that was um, done. It was a 30 millimeter uh, droplet. Um, and I, and I, think it's, I think it's about this guy right here. Um, and, but in fact, we saw a lot of other behaviors, right? And so I said, we tuned it to get a nice one for you. And that's because if you have, um, if you're applying only a low voltage, in fact, you just get a droplet that sits there, right? Um, it might spread out a little bit, okay? But mostly it's just a circular droplet, okay? Doing its own thing. Um, if you turn up the voltage, okay? That's when you get this fantastic fractal-like behavior. That's that uh, magenta region here, okay? We've been calling this regime B. Um, and then one of the things that I love is that, you know, if you think of this as a knob, we just keep turning up the voltage. If B is really cool, what happens if you go even higher, right? Well, the answer is you get to regime C, which is actually less interesting, right? So there's this actually this sweet spot where this happens. Okay, so if you turn up the voltage too high, okay, then it actually starts making these undulations around the edge, but eventually it contracts back, okay? Um, and if you apply even more voltage, um, you actually don't even build up the undulation. It spreads out like a droplet for a bit and then it contracts back. And if what you can't see in pictures like this, is these were um, taken to highlight the interfaces. If you look at the surface in Regime D, you actually see crumples and things on the surface. Okay. So we wanna understand what these different, what's going on that we get these different behaviors. Uh, some of them depend on the volume of the droplet and some of the boundaries, uh, some of the boundaries depend on the volume of the droplet and some of them do not. Okay, so here's that uh, a movie like uh, um, we saw before um, of the, the fractal-like shape developing. And I've, there's some screenshots of this uh, on the right. And then for each of these pictures along the way, uh, as, it, as it grew, we did a house star uh, box counting um, technique to figure out uh, if these were fractals or not. And what we saw is that early on, um, so that's the, the redder ones down here at the squares at the bottom, um, you know, it was a limited range over which you might call it a fractal, okay, and as you waited longer and longer, you saw the development of more and more uh, short wavelength uh, features, okay, and it then developed into this a much larger range of fractal-like behavior. Okay, so, okay, we have a fractal, and, you know, I'm a child of the 80s, I love to see a fractal, um, but 
there's actually utility to this, right? That we can sometimes um, learn what's going on and say, can we use the fact that we know the um, fractal dimension to guess at what the mechanism might be? Because remember, we don't really know what's going on here. Okay? Um, and so this is a this is a picture on the left um, was taken next door to me when I was a grad student. For grad students in the audience, it's it's fun to be jealous of your neighbor's experiments because you think they make pretty pretty pictures and you wish you could make them and then later on in life discover that you get to make them too. Um, so the question is, is, was what we were seeing what's known as directional solidification? So directional solidification, sometimes called dendritic growth, occurs because a solute is solidifying out of uh, an al um, a melt um, that has an alloy, right? And only some of the alloy can be uh, included um, in the solidification and some can't. And these very typically create um, fractal-like patterns um, and they are a candidate for what we might, what might be causing this. Okay, um, another thing it might be, this is more along the lines of folks on this group, is, is this viscous fingering, which happens when a less viscous fluid displaces a more viscous one. Um, if you don't know, um, this can actually work even at zero surface tension. Um, so it's been seen in granular materials and in miscible um, fluids. Um, these are out of the Chicago group. Um, and they make patterns that are, again, somewhat reminiscent of what we're seeing, although not exactly like. Um, and what you can see is that the fractal dimension does not match in any way, right? It's much, much larger fractal dimension than what we're seeing. But also, um, I already told you that e gain only has twice the viscosity of water, right? So this is not really a situation where you are gonna have a strong viscosity contrast that's needed to get viscous fingering. So this doesn't look particularly promising. Um, also might think about surfactant-driven fingering. And obviously, you know this is the one that I'm going to favor because I've set you up for it, OK? Um, but I want to show you some pictures of why we might think this is the case. These pictures do look a little bit, particularly on the left, look a lot like what we've been seeing. Um, and they're known to be caused by Marangoni infects. So you can get um, fingers just from Marangoni infects. And what a Marangoni effect is is just a gradient in the surface tension. So I want to talk a little bit about that, OK? Um, but first we want to start out with the easier case. Okay, so I we have to go unstable from some state. Okay, so the base state that we get was that at low voltages we saw there was no spreading. Okay, and so in fact if you look at the surface it's very shiny. There's not a strong oxide that we can see that's visible. It maintains a spherical shape. Okay, it's actually a spherical cap um, because it has a high surface tension. Okay, and so the reason it spreads out slightly is that it is actually putting in balance gravitational forces against um, surface tension forces, the Laplace pressure, okay? And as we crank up the voltage, okay, there is a little bit more oxide that develops, right? There's also actually some charging uh, on the surface, we now think, um, from electric double layer, okay? Um, but as you increase the voltage, right, the surface tension drops, okay? And it can no longer balance um, gravity against Laplace pressure and stay spherical, it spreads out, okay? And so at that point, of course, the surface tension reduction is being caused by that oxide and the oxide is free to rearrange, right? It doesn't need to stay exactly where it was deposited on the surface, it's a fluid surface, right? And so there can be both transport and there can be diffusion, okay, um, along the surface, okay? And a response to surface tension gradients, okay? Um, so how do we know that that's what's happening here? Well. We know that the, one of the reasons we know the oxide is growing, our first good evidence for that is electrical measurements. Okay, so I promised to tell you a little bit more about these um, two other regimes, the ones where they crumple back up. Okay, so if we just plot the area versus time, okay, if we're in regime A, the area versus time is fairly flat. Um, if you're in regime B, the area versus time continues to grow. This, the fractal grows and grows and grows. Um, if you're in C and D, however, you can see it grows and then comes back, it grows and then comes back, okay. And I wanna focus on regime C because it's easiest to see there, okay? Which is that the point at which it turns around is also the point at which um, its effective resistance grows. And this is a little bit of a kludge measurement. Um, this is not something an electrochemist would do. We've just taken the ratio of voltage uh, to current. These are probably non-ohmic and so it's a slightly dodgy thing to do. Um, but it allows us to illustrate that the point at which the droplet contract is the point at which the electrical resistance spikes quite dramatically, okay? Now, this is interesting because we know that these oxides um, are not electrical conductors, okay? So some of them are insulators, some of them are semiconductors, 
Um, but this says that there is a growth in that oxide, okay, that we can detect its presence electrically. We know it's really there. Um, and so if we lay out this picture all together, okay, what we see is that, so I told you about the beginning and the end, and now we're going to talk about the middle, right, is that if you have a bare metal, you just have Laplace pressure balancing gravity, okay. Um, once you have a thick oxide, okay, um, which we can detect electrically, we actually saw that the droplet contracted. We think this is due to ion insertion. It's something that's been seen in other metals um, like aluminum, um, that if you try to actually drive uh, an ion through a barrier, it actually causes um, a, a, a new surface tension to form, okay. Um, but in this middle state, this regime B, there's a very thin oxide surfactant, almost certainly, to get between zero and lots. Must be thin, okay. Um, we think it's close to zero. And if I'm drawing that as a dashed line here to emphasize that those are individual molecules that can be moving around, okay. And so you could have places where this green dashed line has green dashed lines that are closer together or further apart. There can be concentration gradients, okay. okay. And that is the picture that we think is what's going to cause these Marangoni instabilities uh, to arise, okay. So this is the picture um, of the main states we're going to talk about. And now I'm going to mostly focus on, you know, this regime here and where this fingering might be coming from in this regime in which you have a thin oxide, but not something that's thick enough uh, that really acts like almost like a solid shell. OK, so these are some very recent measurements. Um, and so, you know, I don't know if these are quantitatively we've, we've calibrated everything. Um, but they're extremely informative for understanding what's going on with this thin oxide layer. So this is a collaboration with Sahar Nadimi, who's an electrochemist, um, and Min Young Sung, who'd recently got her PhD in Michael Dickey's group, as long as my grad student Keith Hilaire. We've They've combined the different things they know how to do. Um, and so they've been passing data among each other. Um, and if we are doing one of these measurements where we're carefully controlling the electric um, you know, how much voltage or how much current we apply, right? We actually have a measurement of the current. So if we know how much current um, there was as a droplet was forming, right, we can calculate the total amount of charge that was transferred, okay? If you assume a particular oxide molecule, okay, we don't have to assume this one, but for this calculation, this is the one we were assuming. If you assume a particular oxide molecule, that calculation of the charge, the integrated current, also counts the number of molecules that you made of the oxide. Okay, now some of them could have dissolved, right? So this is now a complicated calculation, okay? So if you use that to estimate the number of molecules, you can calculate a concentration uh, on the surface, okay? And what we've done here is simultaneously measured what the droplet shape is, right, of the droplet and measured its surface tension, okay, as a function of voltage. At the same time, we've done this blue calculation on the left to estimate the concentration. And what you can see is that there is as you increase the voltage, okay, and as you cross from regime A into regime B, which happens about at this point right here, okay, that's where you're going from a low concentration to having probably a molecular monolayer um, on the surface, okay, and that is the point at which the surface tension is dropping, okay, and then it gets more interesting up here, um, and we will leave that for a later time, okay. So we've got some pretty good evidence um, that, that it is actually an oxide um, that is, is causing this to happen. Okay, and that it's thin enough. Let me just whoops, um, go back. Um, this is about what would be a molecular monolayer um, for this size molecule. Sorry, there should be a dashed line on there showing that. Okay, so this really starts to make us give us more evidence that we might be talking about a Marangoni fingering process. Okay, and if you haven't seen these before, um, here's some both classic papers and very recent ones. So this is sort of 30 years of Marangoni fingers. Um, these sorts of fingers have been seen to arise, whether this, there are surface stresses, surface stresses arising from basically any sort of gradient and surface tension, whether it's temperature gradients, which is what uh, Jean Man sort of worked on. Um, um, this is another case where it was the person in the lab next to me um, whose work I loved and it's nice to um, come back to it uh, later. Um, in this case here, it was, um, you know, this is a concentration uh, gradient right, fluid concentrations, um, the, the famous um, tears of wine um, that Andrea Bertozzi's group um, published on last year, right? So, and in this case, we'd be saying it's because of a surfactant distribution at the surface would be causing it, okay? 
um, which is similar to what um, happened in um, Kazabetsuar originally. So this is, question is, can we show that this is what's going on? Okay. Um, so we'll talk briefly about how interfaces go unstable. So any smooth interface is never perfectly smooth. It always has some imper imperfections. Um, you mathematically, you could think about decomposing this into Fourier modes and asking which ones are more or less prevalent. Okay. And so the question that we want to be asking is at what rate modes of some wavelength go unstable, right? Um, do they, if you introduce a perturbation of a particular wavelength, does that perturbation exponentially grow or exponentially decay, right? And this is how you start a linear stability analysis. Okay. So we're not going to do that mathematically. Okay. Um, we're going to do this by observations. And by definition, um, the fastest growing modes are the ones that win out if you have an interface, right? Um, and those are the experiments we're going to do. And this is the, the work of uh, my PhD student, Keith Hilaire. And so he builds um, little bathtubs containing sodium hydroxide um, and a working electrode and a counter electrode. Again, the counter electrodes are kept far away um, so that we can have uniform electric fields and avoid having to see bubbles. Okay, and then there is a reference electrode that's uh, placed in the bath as well. And so he's been building little metal combs. These are copper combs. Okay, you can sort of see the castellation underneath there, um, on which he puts a droplet um, of E gain, okay, and then exposes it to a voltage. And as you can see here, it can undergo tip splitting. Okay, so this is how you can start to test whether or not what you're seeing, you know, fits these sorts of ideas. Okay, so here's a little view of his final setup that I'm gonna show you. He's actually separated the droplets into little, their own bathtubs, um, which suppresses the two balloon instability. Um, he's got it hooked up um, to a potentiostat, okay, um, so that he can apply voltages and a reference electrode dangling uh, back behind it. Um, and then these droplets grow out uh, once a voltage is applied. So here's what that looks like when we're actually running it. These are now plexiglass barriers between the droplets. So they're just more or less like repetitions of the same. Okay, and this is in a place where we were seeing repeated tip splitting. So this is, you know, this is a fractal-like behavior, right? That you see tip splits upon tip splits upon tip splits until you break, until your wire gets too thin uh, and you disconnect and then you roll to wherever was downhill that day. Again, this was supposedly level, but we ne never quite achieved it. All right, so we can draw a phase diagram and say, as a function of, this is J is the current density. Um, so as a function of the current density um, and the initial width of the finger, so what width of bathtub, open bathtub we built uh, for each droplet. Um, so there's actually bathtubs that are closed on three sides and open on one side to the electrolyte. Um, and because the metal wets the copper, they stay there um, until we apply a voltage. Then they do a droplet-like shape. These are top views, droplet-like shape. Um, and then in this regime, we see single tip splitting, okay? And in this regime, we see this continued tip splitting, okay? And there's a threshold below which we do not see tip splitting, okay? So our hypothesis is gonna be that um, four and five are uh, faster growing uh, than the longer wavelength modes, and therefore that's why um, we're not seeing them there. It actually splits into fingers of those widths. Okay. So this is a testable hypothesis. Um, we can actually measure how fast they grow. Um, so example, here's a little um, a droplet. We can actually use this like a bit like a pendant drop experiment to measure surface tension if we want as well. I, I'm not showing that data here, um, but the curvature of this, and the shape of this tells you the, um, the surface tension in situ. Um, but as we watch this length grow over time um, for different amounts of currents, and this is sort of measured in milliamps per finger, which turns out to be useful calibration for us to keep track when we have multiple fingers. Um, okay, so if we take the, how, that growth rate, the average initial growth rate, and we plot that um, as a function of current density for different finger widths, um, what we see is in fact that these four and five uh, millimeter um, initial widths are the ones that grow, oh, they grow faster uh, than um, wider widths, okay, and therefore they are the shape that wins out, okay, and this is why if you have a large undulation, it splits into two smaller undulations, okay. We didn't go above 10 because the pattern had become, become clear by this point. So this is where this tip splitting instability is coming from, okay. So is it really a Marangoni instability? So we have some indirect evidence for this that's getting closer and closer to direct, okay. So, um, Keith built um, a dome that can basically provide uniform monochromatic illumination onto a finger. 
Um, and the experiment he's done here is that every 10 seconds, he cranks up uh, the voltage, okay? And so this is now a light intensity plot that's just running from zero, from min to max for the whole picture, right? Um, these are in arbitrary units, okay? And so at low voltage, okay, we have a lower concentration. It appears that the oxide, um, that the a lower brightness here appears to correspond to lower amount of oxide. We don't have a good calibration for this. Um, and if you crank up the voltage, then it grows more oxide, so it's suddenly brighter. Okay, but that oxide redistributes, right? There's actually a gradient here from the tip to the back. And if you crank up the voltage one more time, you grow some more oxide and that oxide redistributes. Okay, and this is all in a regime where we're not seeing tip splitting. These are nice, flat, um, stable fingers here. Okay, so we have some evidence that there is in fact an ox oxide gradients that are present in the system. Um, another experiment you can do is because it wets copper, you can throw some copper filings on the surface of it. And as you run the experiment, uh, track what the copper filings do, okay? And I'm gonna focus on this guy at the um, right. So the finger is growing outwards, but as you can see on the guy at the right, these um, copper uh, tracings are actually flowing backwards, okay? So that would be presumably because of the gradient in surface tension, okay? And here's a close up of that finger where they're now color coded. We've color coded um, three specks. Um, so you can see in fact that this red guy um, is actually moving backwards over time. Okay, so there's some sense that that's the direction that the fluid flow is happening on the surface, even as the bulk is moving out. Okay. So the, the, the um, key, let me just, before I go to the next one. So the, the key sort of counter argument that's been made to us as to, you know, maybe these are electric forces and not Marangoni forces. Um, we've done some controlled experiments to say, we don't think that's the dominant effect. It's not that they're not present. Um, and you can do this by instead of having an electric field gradient that is in the same direction um, as the flow, have it be perpendicular. Okay, so in the next um, movie, the counter electrode is placed above the droplet, which of course now makes bubbles and we can't see things so well. Okay, but now the electric field is vertical, but it's still building oxide. Okay, that oxide still makes um, the surface go unstable as the droplet uh, spread outward because the surface tension is dropping. Okay, so we don't think that the electric forces um, themselves, you know, um, Coulomb forces are what are driving these. Um, it's not electrokinetics. We do think it's Marangoni. Okay, um, let me check the time here since that doesn't show on my screen. Good, we have time to talk about um, a more recent set of things where we sort of said, uh, we turned the experiment sideways. We said, um, you know, or I guess maybe not sideways, we changed the aspect ratio from being uh, wide and flat to being tall and thin. Okay, and so Min Young Sung, this is part of her PhD work, um, is the, um, where she used a syringe pump to pump um, liquid metal at a known flow rate out into a, a large bath of sodium hydroxide. Okay, and then again, we can see a phase diagram of the various states that you see. Okay, and so the morphologies go from being um, droplets that fall, um, eventually connected droplets that stay with a thread connecting them. Um, then we get these amazingly smooth wires, okay? And eventually we, we grow things that look almost like Chianti bottles with dripping wax, okay? And I'm gonna show you a movie um, as we cut across one of these, I think it's down here, we cut across one of these lines, okay? Where we're slowly increasing electric potential as the liquid metal flows out um, at a particular um, flow rate set by the syringe pump. And again, because this is a low viscosity material, um, this can be done, okay. So initially you see droplets, this is the dripping faucet regime, um, right? Um, these have high surface tension, so they're very, very spherical, okay? As the surface tension drops, you get connected drops, and then you get to these beautiful wires, okay? And there are fluctuations along the wire, and then you start to develop these uh, very stable crusty bits, okay? And again, this, and so this probably recalls things I've already shown you, right? That you can get a crust that allows things to stay, okay? And what I wanna focus on is um, that wire, right? Because it is allowing us to understand how low the surface tension goes, okay? And if you recall the movie that um, I showed you of the fractal life shapes, we saw that there were areas of both positive and negative curvature, um, which suggests very, very low surface tensions. Um, and this is a picture of one of those wires, a movie of one of those wires hitting the ground, um, the base of the, um, the bath, the sodium hydroxide bath. And you can see that there's this very smooth wire here, okay? And, you know, this is 
perhaps surprising. Again, we think of liquid metals as having very high surface tension, okay? Um, which means that they should be very, very subject to Rayleigh plateau instabilities, okay? Um, if you're not familiar with the Rayleigh plateau instability, the, there's two curvatures in a, um, a falling stream, a curvature around the wire and a curvature that uh, involves any of the undulations of the wire, okay? Um, and so the stream curvature, um, which are the, what I've shown as the gray circles, right? Um, they happen at each, you know, peak and um, valley, right? Um, and if you look at those, that there's a lower Laplace pressure at the peaks and the trough, right? And so this means that fluid is going to get squeezed into the peak regions, making them peakier, right? <laughs> okay, now if you look at the wave curvature, so that's the gray arcs, okay? Um, the peaks have positive um, curvature, the troughs have negative uh, curvature, okay? So this means that fluid is squeezed into the trough region. So these are two competing effects. You know, does the fluid go into the peaks or does it go into the troughs? And so the instability happens when the stream curvature dominates over the wave curvature and you get the droplets, okay? And so at high surface tension, which is what you saw in the beginning where you had droplets coming down, that's what you see, but eventually this ends because the surface tension has gotten low enough, okay? That you no longer um, can have the stream, the stream curvature dominating over the wave curvature. Okay, so that's the, that's the general picture. So here's Minyoung's longest wire she ever made. It was the tallest container they could find in the Dickey lab. Um, so it's 64 centimeters long. You can just barely see it. Maybe you can't even see it over Zoom. It's a very thin wire in here. Um, and so she was able to get a stream that was 200 microns wide fall over a height of 64 centimeters without going unstable. Okay, and if you just do sort of the most boring possible calculation, which is estimate the time to go unstable, um, right, and, you know, how fast it's falling, um, and, you know, how far we saw it go, you can get the surface tension needs to be essentially zero for this to work. Now, that's if surface tension is the only effect. I don't think it's the only effect, um, but if it were the only effect, these are extremely low surface tensions, as we were expecting. Okay, so here's why I don't think it's the only effect. So this is a, a movie that Min Young took where she was, she's gonna see the syringe pump move in a minute. She's gonna move these threads around and they're almost making catenaries. They almost behave, um, you know, like some sort of rope. And in the earlier picture I showed you, there was coiling behavior, right? Um, so these are objects that are a fluid falling, but they have this oxide, very thin, but present oxide shell on them. That's probably also falling. Um, we've actually tracked surface disturbances moving down, okay? And so this object is not purely something that we can think of as just uh, a Rayleigh plateau instability, um, but it is definitely along those lines and very, very high surface tension. Okay, so we can compare these two regimes, these two different geometries that we've talked about, okay? So um, when we started off the um, talk, um, I was telling you about um, droplets that were flat um, on a plane, okay, and if they applied a low voltage, um, you basically saw spherical like drops. And that was true also for this stream, okay, that you saw things that these are now pendant drop shapes because gravity is influencing them strongly, okay. But these are pendant drops and these are sessile drops, okay. And we did not see that the transition between these behaviors depended on um, the surface area or on the rate of creation of new surface in the case of the fiber, of the, the wire, right? So in all of these cases, if you're building up oxide, it must be true that the local deposition rate from the electrochemical process is bigger than the dissolution rate. Um, and so you don't see a, a dependence on volume or flow rate, okay? Once you have more oxide present, okay? And so you're making a transition, okay? So now we're in this, if we look at, we compare regime B, okay, uh, where we thought we had very low surface tensions to this wire, where we think we have very low surface tensions. Every, this is extremely low surface tensions, you know, very close to zero, okay, and there are almost certainly gradients on the surface, right, that are um, in one case causing um, an instability, in the other case suppressing an instability, which I think is extremely fascinating, um, okay, and once you leave that regime and you're talking about a thicker oxide, these are ones where we saw the electrical Conduct, um, resistance measurements go up. We saw that they were able to form um, long-lived stable structures that these even could exert um, contractile forces, right? In that regime, what we're seeing is that there is a surface area dependence, right? So it depends on either the volume of the droplet or the flow rate, okay? And so what this suggests, there's some sort of transport limiting process. And so you need a higher voltage in order to get 
the buckle deposition rate to be greater than the solution rate. Okay, um, and so what those processes are, um, again, these are now you're trying to transport ions through a crusty surface, right? There's a lot more going on there that we have not begin, begun to understand, except to say that we can identify features um, that are present there. All right, and um, so to conclude, um, I hope um, I have shown you that this is a very, very cool fluid dynamic system. Um, it has some complicated electrochemistry. I knew no electrochemistry before I started this project. It's been a tremendous amount of fun to learn it. Um, but um, and it's easy to make the oxides, right? So from an experimental standpoint, it's not difficult. Understanding it has been challenging. Okay. So these liquid metals very, very easily produce surface oxides by any electrochemical reaction. So pretty much any electrolyte you stick there with a voltage, you'll get this to happen. Okay. Um, so there's a huge space in which to uh, do experiments there. Okay. What we've seen is that these oxides that you generate are extremely powerful surfactant and they can drop the surface tension practically to zero. Um, and that has two effects. One is to create fractal-like patterns if in, in a, in a pancake-like geometry. Um, and in a wire-like geometry, it serves to suppress Rayleigh plateau instabilities. Okay. Um, the other cool thing, and you've seen, you saw this a couple places, like when um, these droplets disconnected from this fractal, right? As soon as the applied voltage is released, because they're no longer connected electrically, the oxide dissolves back off and you get going to acting a spherical droplet again. Okay, so what this means is that you could be using an applied voltage, right, which could be a patterned voltage. It could be time patterns, it could be space patterns, right? You can reversibly stabilize or destabilize the spreading. And I think this provides a tremendous playground for doing some very, very cool engineering around these fluid dynamics. Um, and the last thing, and this is what's you know drawing a lot of my, my fascination these days, is that we really do think these are Marangoni instabilities. Um, because it's tough to see the oxide, it's really tough to pin that down. Um, and I think there's a real need um, to develop some modeling in here that helps us um, sort of resolve, you know, can we can we actually predict things like um, that the um, fingers go um, unstable above you know five millimeters? That's a testable prediction where. If we got a model to predict that, we would be much more certain that we had, you know, gotten key features of the instability correct, right, and things like that. Um, and I am going to um, stop there. Um, if you want to get in touch with me, um, then if you, your questions don't get answered here, you can find me um, at both of those two places. Um, if I may, just ask two questions. The first is uh, the first movie that you showed of a metal spreading into an aqueous solution. I think it was sodium something or other. Could you tell me what the viscosities of the two were? And the reason I ask is it looks so much like Safman-Taylor instability. It does, and we th so there's it's only a factor of two difference in viscosity. Egain just has, but, is just twice as viscous as water and the electrolyte is essentially water. But one second, wh which is the more viscous? It's not the oh, factor. So, of so yes, so the, yes, it is the Egain is more viscous, but only by a factor of two. And the, only other, by a factor of two. and the other thing, if I may say, I think it's uh, possible to have stable circular uh, spreading with no surface tension. And I say that partly because uh, uh, Keith Moffat is doing some calculations with which I'm involved at the moment, where he's looked at the stability. And even if there's zero surface tension, it's stable and becomes circular. And the other thing which I just... Uh, so permissible, yeah, so those would be permissible things, basically. Right, but it's also possible for them to be unstable, right, which is, let me just pull up those two pictures again. Oh, it's not well, a requirement that it be stable. Um, without a doubt, it's just that I think you said at the beginning, and this is not word for word, my memory's not good enough, uh, it's surface tension that causes circular smooth uh, displacements. And I don't think it need necessarily be surface tension. No, no, but in this case, there is surface tension, right? So oh. I guess, yeah. So in the, in the initial case, there, it's 500 millinewtons per meter. There's, there's huge surface tension initially. But there's no doubt that there are cases where surface tension plays a role. I don't mean, I don't mean to say that no surface tension can't be stable. Yes. Correct. That, that was, if I said that, that was misspoken. Yeah. yeah, and the granular case is a little special. It's a little weird, right? It's a little weird. Well, right. there, it's not a fluid case, you know. Okay. Even though I've written on granular materials and granular <laughs> collapses, it ain't fluid mechanics. <laughs> no, no, it's not. But um, but the but the second one is is a fluid. So the um, Sir Ermgard um, Bishop Berger's work is a, is two fluids and they're miscible. 
and she's done a lot of experiments characterizing the, uh, you're probably aware of them already, but um, so the, the point here is more that we don't think it's, we don't think it's viscous fingering. We don't think it's soft and tailor. It could be, right? We don't think it is. And this is where modeling is gonna help us, right? This is where modeling will help us sort these things out. How different is the regime diagram if you apply a constant current rather than a constant voltage? Mm. Yes, okay. So we've actually done both. <laughs> um, so the, actually, I don't think I have one in this, it's in the supplemental material, but I don't have it sitting he right here in this talk. Um, it does change somewhat. So here's why we do constant current rather than constant voltage, is because we want to do this trick of knowing how many molecules of oxide we made, right? Um, so we go back and forth between the two, right? Um, and you can draw this a very similar phase diagram with voltage as well. Ah, Stephen Morris. Okay, Electro <laughs> electrical convection is possible in a driven system. Ever see that? It happens near the tips in electro deposition experiments. So, okay, so we have seen that we have driven it in ways we think this could be happening. Um, we also have done cool ones where it, we do it in a little so many under experiments in a little tiny bathtub where it's supposed to be one droplet, um, and we were hoping to be able to, to suppress instabilities, but she saw quick convection turnovers all of the time. So I can put you in touch with her because they were experiments that we abandoned because they were tough to control, but they probably are this. Yeah. Um, I was struck by the fact that your little droplets that pinch off tended to roll away. Is it possible that they're self-propelled somehow by, by convection currents or by gradients? Yeah, of we, that we do not know. We think, so we can tell them which direction to go by like the tiniest of tilts, right? So we've done experiments where we took our experiment, we tilted it by known amounts. We actually use this as sort of an electric field balance. We tried to estimate the maximum electric field that could be present driving things. And so we could balance an electric field with gravity. Um, so we can basically tell them which direction to go with gravity. So it is probably the largest effect. We um, but all of the other things are almost certainly present and it's very difficult to tease them apart. Um, and the one thing that's so difficult to tease they them apart is that the tiniest them. bit of gravity makes them go one direction. I would, so that we don't like working with rolling droplets. They've been very hard to work with. Well, they can also climb electric fields and field gradients. Yeah, so we, so we, exactly, yeah. So we haven't gotten them to climb, but we have gotten some balancing going on. Yeah, so there could be, there could well be some way to do propulsion this way. Um, but we haven't seen something that definitively looks like that. Yeah. I mean, I would design a different experiment for that. I would design a channel, right? So that they were constrained to go in one direction and do some other things. Yeah, that's so a good the question. Ba the, the basis of your claim that it's not electrical is are these reversed electrode experiments. Because you know, yeah. if you charge the surface, the surface tension goes down, whether yeah. it's positively or negatively charged and gradients of surface charge are gonna happen on any strangely shaped. Right, so this drop. is not electro wetting. Okay, so this is actually, this is actually a subtle question. Electro wetting. So let me go get the picture that um, if folks know electro wetting, um, they think that this is part of a parabola, right, and the point of zero charge is here and it's symmetric. Okay, so this does play a role. And so actually right now we're working on, we're starting to write down a free energy model for the surface tension, right, that takes into account both the double layer charging being either positive or negative, right, and the effect of the oxides. And so certainly all of that is playing a role. All of that, all of that is there, right? But the, but the, the driving outward is the one that does not depend on the charging, it seems. It's not that it's not there. It's just, it's not the one doing the main thing. I see in a question about oxidation rate. Yes. So this is why we do both controlled voltage and controlled uh, current experiments is we're trying to get a handle on this, right? So um, both the oxidation rate and the dissolution rate. Um, and these depend sensitively on the molarity of the solution, right? They, um, they depend on your particular choice of the solution. Um, you know, you can take, take a different electrolyte than sodium hydroxide. Um, so both of those experiments are ongoing, and so I don't have results to present to you on that. Um, but we are trying to nail that down. Actually, there's a, um, 
it's a really, really interesting electrochemistry involved in that. And so a student, a master's student who's very interested in electrochemistry, that's been his project um, the last couple of months is try to, to try to nail that. Um, I will say that um, it's an open question in the chemistry literature, which reactions are happening. Um, and so we have a second problem that it's not totally clear which oxides we're producing. So I wrote one here that's our guess. Um, we're getting close to being able to say whether, where, when this is the right answer and when this is not the right answer. Um, so there's a lot going on with the electrochemistry that's not my work, it's the electrochemists are doing that. 